the back rooms. You've been here before. Level 8, cave systems. You emerge from a lake, soaked and shivering in the icy air. Wading to shore, your knees buckle beneath you, causing you to stumble and collapse onto dry ground. You sit for a brief moment, collecting yourself, knees huddled to your chest as you scan your surroundings. A subterranean chamber, dark and alien, yawns before you. Haphazard, jagged spikes hang down from the ceiling and jut up from the floor, illustrating a visual similar to that of thick iron bars in a dungeon cell. Craggy tunnels branch out from the room on all sides, harboring untold horrors lurking in the depths beneath and the labyrinths above. Chittering and clicking from creatures unseen bounce off the walls of the cavern and ring in your ears, along with what might just be the faintest, most distant echoes of human screams. You are imprisoned still, in the heart of the earth. The sinking weight of despair returns to your chest. As you get back on your feet, you notice a sign erected several feet to your left, somewhat obscured by cobwebs. It is just barely legible, painted on with some strange concoction that glitters dimly in the inky blackness. Printed in neat lettering alongside a familiar eagle insignia are the words, Welcome to the Ninth Road, Meg Outpost, 8.7 miles, 14 kilometers. Help is ahead, stay strong. Meg, bettering humanity. And thus, the journey continues. You trudge onwards. Level 8. Cave Systems. Survival Difficulty. Class 4. Environment. 4 out of 5. Extreme Environmental Risk. Exit. 4 out of 5. Very Difficult to Exit. Entities. 4 out of 5. Extreme Hostile Presence. Description. The eighth level of the backrooms is the last of the initial twelve whose environment is wholly enclosed. A sprawling network of underground caves, its web of tunnels is interwoven into a suffocating prison. It is cold, dark, and fraught with peril, predators lurking at every turn. Given a choice, wanderers are warned to avoid it altogether. Image Caption a dark cave greets wanderers surfacing from the waters. Structure and layout. By the standards of normal reality, the architecture of most levels prior resemble artificial constructions. Level 8, in contrast, runs wild. Unlike other subterranean domains such as the sewers of level 34, sewer system, the mines of level 181, protected caverns, or the catacombs of level 499, terrestrial paradise, level 8 is generally free of the visage of human engineering, composed predominantly of organic karst caves. Even today, humanity's attempts to civilize this untamed space remain futile, and its natural forces reign unchecked. Its rocky passages are savage, feral, and formidable. Show Map Image Caption A rough map of Level 8's cave networks, as seen from, quote-unquote, above. In terms of size, Level 8 is practically infinite. Most settlements, entrances, and exits are clustered closely, within a long cylindrical zone approximately 60 miles, 95 kilometers, in length, and 2.5 miles, 40 kilometers, in radius. New Passages furthermore, are continually discovered, and the vast majority of the level has yet to be explored. Its true depth remains unknown. You have been walking, rather crawling, for hours. The passageway has narrowed into a tight tunnel, and you have been forced to move on your hands and knees to make it through. The rocks press in against your shivering body weighing down on your weary shoulders and squeezing the air out from your lungs. As you push through a particularly narrow crevice, you feel something wriggle over your right shin and past your ankle. 
It has too many legs. You crawl faster. The tunnel feels like it's swirling around you as you clamber on. You are sure that you were traveling horizontally just a minute ago, but even though there have been no twists or turns, you now feel the force of gravity straining down against your body. Cold sweat starts to drip down your face, drenching your heaving chest. Your stomach lurches. Nevertheless, you spot an end to the tunnel just ahead. Your movements become haphazard, careless, desperate. You gain a few additional scrapes clawing and grasping at the rocks around you. Finally, you muster the strength for a final push upward, squeezing through the opening into a large, round chamber. You lay on the floor, exhausted from the strain, and attempt to gather your bearings. This chamber feels oddly familiar. You could swear you've seen that rock before. The one that looks just a tad too much like a human face. You spot a marker on the ceiling. It's been a while since you last saw one. You strain your eyes, trying to make out the lettering in the gloom. Ninth Road, marker number 74. You frown in confusion. Didn't you just pass number 78 an hour ago? Or was that number 73? Where are you? Haven't you been here before? Non-standard physics. Level 8 is by no means easy to traverse. The very laws governing its nature are unforgiving in every way. Like many preceding levels, it is subject to the characteristic spatial distortions of non-Euclidean geometry. In other words, space itself functions in a non-linear fashion within its caves. An apparently straight passageway may loop back on itself. Taking the same path a second time may lead to a different chamber. Turning back may not return one to where they came from before. The confusion of this experience is only compounded by erratic gravitational forces. Gravity fluctuates in magnitude and changes direction from cavern to cavern, sometimes even within a single cave itself. These shifts are chaotic, unpredictable, and thoroughly perplexing. At its very worst, successful navigation through level 8 demands military precision. One wayward step can easily confuse the senses. A missed sign may cost one their bearings. A wrong turn will almost certainly result in complete and total disorientation. Focus is essential. Mistakes are lethal. Even expert cartographers have lost their way in their valiant attempts to map the tunnels, driven mad as they roam the level's webs. Their missing bodies are seldom found. Moreover, Level 8 is known for its entropic effects. Though the flow of time itself is unaltered, the effects of time are sped up considerably. Food spoils rapidly, batteries drain quickly, and long-term residents even appear to age at an accelerated rate. Sounds echo louder, and lamps shine dimmer than expected. Footnote: A regular flashlight which ordinarily supplies 100 lumens of light will only supply 12 lumens, the brightness of an average candle within level 8. End footnote. Entropic effects also intensify when an area is left unobserved. As a result, signposts and navigation markers degrade extremely fast, requiring consistent maintenance or replacement. Meg Survival Guide Note, found yourself stuck in the caves? Fret not, this guide is here to help. Just stay calm and follow these instructions and you'll be out in no time. Probably. No guarantee. End note. Tip number one, stay on the ninth road. Image caption, our mascot Kenneth says hello. Our trusty navigation teams here at the Meg have marked out a path known as the Ninth Road to help you find your way around. The road starts at the entrance pool from level 6 and runs all the way to the exit at level 9. So, if you're making your way out, it's your best bet. We know the caverns can be unforgiving. Thankfully, the Ninth Road runs through what we call Islands of Stability. 
regions where space and gravity function more consistently than everywhere else on the level. This makes the road a safe and reliable route for any wanderer to travel. If you're up for some sights, it even goes past a couple of the nicer landmarks along the way. The road also passes by settlements run by our very own operatives in conjunction with our friends at the BNTG and the Harmouth Society. You can stop for a shower, a change of clothes, a hot meal, and a place to rest. If you've got things to trade, you can even hire a guide. The road is lined with markers about every 50 meters or so. That's 55 yards for you American folks to keep you on track. You'll recognize them by the familiar Meg logo printed on. Whatever you may face, be sure to follow the markers. We can't stress this enough. Otherwise, who knows where you'll end up. Stay safe. You are cold. Moisture first began dripping from the ceiling. Then it trickled from the walls and pooled as a stream along the floor. It was welcome at first. It quenched your thirst, almond flavored as it was. The waters became a little less welcome when they rose past your ankles. And now, they are at your neck. As you wade through the rushing stream, you spot a generously large ledge, several feet above the water, at the opposite end of the cavern. You quicken your pace towards it. The waters are at your chin now. You pause for a moment, scanning your surroundings for any closer sign of dry land. There is none. As you continue your desperate trudge forward, you try not to imagine what creatures might lurk under the rippling waves. You try not to imagine that the ground, with every step, might suddenly give way to a yawning chasm, hidden beneath the flood's uniform surface. The waters have risen to your bottom lip. The ledge is still several paces away, out of reach. You tilt your head back to stay above the waters flailing your arms wildly as you begin to lose your balance. The waters rise past your upper lip and continue to climb. You have no choice. You must swim. As the waves surge upward, you kick off the ground with your feet, propelling your face above the water for one last moment, taking one final gulp of air. The next instant, you plunge your head into the icy depths. Environment. The environs of level 8 are thoroughly inhospitable. Oxygen is often limited. The air, in many cases, is foul and stagnant, harboring dangerous concentrations of carbon dioxide. Some contain harmful gases such as hydrogen sulfide, chlorine, ammonia, or a raw compound similar to Rixa gas. Footnote. Air tests of key regions have been conducted by the Harmouth Speleological Society. Full chemical analyses have been provided to MEG databanks and are available by email request. End footnote. Deaths by asphyxiation are common, though they pale in comparison to the sheer loss of life by drowning alone. Almond water flows freely across the caverns, ebbing and flowing chaotically under the influence of unseen tides. Many caves are partially or fully waterlogged, inaccessible to most except experienced divers. Fluctuating water levels means that some networks are particularly prone to sudden, spontaneous flooding. Bone-dry chambers may be completely submerged in a matter of seconds. Those who escape drowning may yet die of hypothermia, most regions carry frigid temperatures of 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Some systems, however, have been known to reach sweltering heights of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius, and above, owing to peculiarities in their chemical and ecological composition. Meg Survival Guide Tip number two, stay hydrated, warm, and awake. Level 8 is full of almond water. You can find pools of it all around, and it's generally safe to drink. It might taste a bit bitter, but that's just some harmless minerals that found their way in from the rocks around. They're actually good for you. Although it's good to hydrate, be aware that taking a bath is a really bad idea. 
it might be refreshing at first, but because of how cold the caves are, you can soon get very sick. Instead, avoid taking a dip, and put some proper warm clothing on if you can. Our friends at Harmouth can supply you proper caving suits at any of their camps. They've got warm fleece on the inside and waterproof polyester on the outside, not to mention lots of handy pockets. That way, if you have to wade through a puddle or a waterfall, you can stay nice and dry and keep yourself from freezing up. Image caption. Oops, Kenneth got wet. Another important tip, whatever happens, keep awake. If you do get drenched and feel cold, know that the victims of hypothermia, freezing to death, that is, tend to die because they give in to exhaustion. When they close their eyes, they can't open them again. It might be unpleasant, but if you force yourself to keep going, you might just make it to safety. Help often isn't as far as you may think. What if you're not cold, or what? Well, unless you're absolutely sure you're in a place that's safe, it's still unwise to take a snooze. If you've got friends with you, sleep in shifts, and only if you absolutely must. Note that drowsiness can be a sign of dangerously low oxygen levels, all the more reason not to doze off. Besides, who knows what might happen to you while you nap. A spider might crawl into your mouth. Blah. Keep those eyes open. By some miracle, you have made it to the ledge. You grab the rough, rocky surface with both hands and heave yourself up onto dry land. Coughing, sputtering, and sopping wet, you emerge from the waters for a second time since your arrival in the caves. You lie on your back, shivering. You dry slowly, the moisture and the last vestiges of life within you leaching out from your skin into the frigid air. The ceiling begins to drift in and out of focus. Perhaps, perhaps you should take a rest. Perhaps sleep will bring you strength. As your eyelids start to droop, your head lulls to the left. A human silhouette stares back at you, seated against the wall. You now find yourself, quite remarkably, up on your feet, staring in astonishment at this new acquaintance. He is dead. Laid neatly at his feet is his backpack. You rummage through it, claiming for yourself a battery-powered heater and a flashlight. Somehow, your fumbling, quivering fingers manage to turn the heater on. You sit for a minute, warming yourself, as you stare curiously at your dead savior. The cause of death is obvious. You can see the dent in his skull, where his head must have hit the floor as he attempted to scale the wall against which he is now reclining. It is unclear, however, how he had died in such a prim and proper position. Perhaps in his last moments he had set himself aright to find some dignity in death. Perhaps he'd had others with him who had laid him there after his passing. Tentatively, you reach forward to press your fingers against his wrist and then his neck. There is no doubt about it, he is dead, though the body is without pulse and cold to the touch. There are no spiders or moths about, neither is there the foul stench of decay. His demise cannot have been more than a day ago, for he has not yet begun to rot. You now eye the orange caving suit. You hesitate, clutching the zipper between your thumb and forefinger. You stare into the body's lifeless, unseeing eyes. They stare back, expressionless. You wonder what he would think if he were still alive. You wonder what his friends might think if they ever returned. You wonder if you give him your own clothes afterwards. Will what you are do about to do be just a little bit less appalling? Wincing apologetically, you close your eyes and turn your face away in shame. With a trembling hand, you pull swiftly down on the zipper. You undress the corpse and claim its clothes. Terrain and Speleology 
the level's cavernous terrain makes no accommodations for human comfort. Even along the ninth road, smaller tunnels tend to be tight, low, and awkwardly shaped. The floors of larger chambers are littered with loose rocks, making it easy to slip. Vertical shafts require great physical exertion and athletic prowess to scale. Corpses are strewn along difficult passages with shattered bones and fractured skulls. Level 8 Report Intriguing Intricacies Perilous as they are, these caves hold a remarkably diverse spectrum of rock formations. The mysterious workings of the extra-normal physics here have resulted in eccentric networks which are as beautiful as they are dangerous. Among bolder and more well-equipped communities, such as ours, they have long been the basis of much careful study. Signed, Sir Reginald Harmouth III, founder of the Harmouth Speleological Society. Descriptions of typical cavern types and rock formations are detailed below. Phreatic Tubes Image Caption A phreatic tube Note the cavern's elliptical, quote-unquote, eye shape. In regular reality, phreatic tubes take form when water and sedimentary particles erode cracks between rocks over time, particularly at the horizontal surface between two different mineral beds, known as the bedding plane. As they are formed by a consistent flow of fluid, phreatic tubes are known for their roughly uniform quote-unquote, eye-shaped structure, with the cavern ceiling arcing upwards and the floor arcing downwards from the bedding plane. However, due to the effects of non-standard physics and inconsistent gravity, many phreatic tubes in level 8 form chaotically. Bedding planes are often not uniform and not even horizontal. Phreatic tubes may form in oddly slanted directions, and often twist and loop in apparently impossible directions. Vados Stage Caves Image Caption A Narrow Vados Trogue Vados Stage Caves form when the water level in a phreatic tube drops, such that a stream flows only along the floor. In the front rooms, the ceiling and walls of a phreatic tube remain unchanged, while the stream continues to erode the floor, forming a depression in the ground, known as a Vados Trogue. In level 8, fluctuating gravitational forces mean that Vados Trogues do not always form downward. Often, wanderers may find Vados Trogues, which curve and loop nonsensically, are carved across walls, or even dig upwards against the ceiling. The orientation of Trogues can be helpful to wanderers, indicating the general direction of gravity within a Vagos, Vados stage cavern, though this is not totally reliable. Breakdown Chambers Breakdown chambers occur when phreatic or Vados stage caves grow large enough that they can no longer support their own weight. The curved ceiling crumbles till it forms a flatbed, littering the floor beneath those with loose rocky debris. Owing to gravitational extranormalities within level 8, the boulders from some such collapses never reach the floor. Meg Survival Guide Tip number 3. Don't touch that. Level 8 is full of wacky caves and rock formations. Some of the most fascinating of these are floating rocks. Yep, you read that right. Because of the weird gravity in level 8, rocks can sometimes end up suspended in midair. This can range from a couple of floating pebbles to huge floating islands hovering right in the middle of the largest caverns. Image Caption Don't disturb the floating rocks. We warn you, no matter how interesting these formations look, do not touch them. Though some larger formations are stable and can support considerable weight, others are flimsy enough that the slightest prod can cause them to come crashing down. These structures may be curious, but you don't want to test them out. Don't be nosy. Rock Formations Stalactites and stalagmites ordinarily grow top-down and bottom-up, respectively. In Level 8, this is not always the case. The distinction in name between stalactites and stalagmites is no longer helpful here. 
and speleologists studying these formations have taken to collectively terming them stalag spikes. In some caverns, clusters of stalag, stalag spikes jut chaotically outward from the walls at all angles, slanting erratically in every direction. Some are known to loop around, form knots, zigzag wildly, or end in multiple sharp points. Owing to their random size and shape, they act as obstacles to navigation, and pose a serious risk of laceration and impalation. You try not to look down. This is the third vertical passage in the last hour. Your stamina has faded. The muscles in your arms and legs burn in agony. But you know that if you let go, you will more than likely be skewered on the razor-sharp spikes below. Taking a deep breath, you count to three. One, two, three. You swing your right leg upward. It catches the ledge, and you hoist yourself up in triumph. Then, your forehead smacks against something hard. It breaks off, clattering onto the floor, while you yourself fall to the ground, inches from the ledge you had just scaled. Whispered curses escape your lips into the blackness, and you massage your bruised temple as you get back up on your feet. F from your right thigh pocket, you retrieve your flashlight and shine it onto the shard of rock that had so cruelly assailed you. Its shape is strangely recognizable. You walk over, crouch down, and pick up the object for a closer look. Is that a kazoo? You hold the instrument in the palm of your hand, bewildered. Its texture is rough and jagged, like that of an uncarved stone, but the shape is undeniable. You look back at the stalactite, where the object appears to have originated, in disbelief. Wherever the ridiculous object you are holding came from, surely you must have collided with something else. You try to place the kazoo back onto the spike, convinced that it cannot fit. But the mouth of the kazoo defies your expectations. Fitting into the break in the stone perfectly, you frown and turn away. It is only then that you begin to notice your surroundings in earnest. As you pan your torch across the cavern, your puzzlement does not subside. You are utterly dumbfounded. The chamber is filled with musical instruments made of rock which, against all odds, appear to have formed naturally. On your right are a violin, a guitar, and what looks to be a trombone, all jutting out of the wall at bizarre angles. Above you are a collection of wind chimes tethered to the ceiling with intricate stone ch chain links. On your left is a toilet seat, surrounded by an assortment of bongo drums arranged in a nonsensical fashion. Several of them are upside down. You wonder if you are going insane. Cautiously, you reach out your hand towards the wind chimes above you, the kazoo still clutched between your fingers. You use it to prod the hanging structure ever so gently. The chimes clink heavily in response, their gentle ring reverberating faintly through the caves. Rarely, some stalag spike clusters form highly detailed, geometric, man-made, or organic shapes, such as octagonal pillars, tulip buds, staplers, or human hands, complete with unique fingerprints. Such spikes have been tested chemically, and results indicate that they are somehow composed entirely of naturally occurring minerals, with no discernible difference from surrounding rocks. Traces of prior carving by humans or entities is also absent, and has been ruled out. The process that formed these curious structures remains a mystery. Stalag spikes and similar rock constructs are recognized as an uncanny wonder unique to Level 8 and its cave systems. Ecology Some portions of Level 8 appear empty, devoid of entities altogether. Others, however, house entire habitats, which teem with life. Level 8 Report Entity ecosystems? Most people are used to seeing entities in the back rooms as these senseless monsters. They quote unquote spawn and quote unquote despawn randomly. They don't need to sleep, sleep, or eat. They eat people anyway. But in level 8, things function differently. 
In my recent expeditions with the Harmoth Society, we've uncovered caverns with entire ecosystems full of life. Most shocking of all, these habitats work coherently. They've got functioning food chains and energy cycles that actually sustain what's living inside them. In any case, this lines up well with my recent theories on the way entities actually function. Humanity's conventional understanding of them has got to change. We're always going to be afraid of things we don't understand, but that doesn't mean that these things are impossible for us to grasp. The existence of coherent ecosystems within Level 8 proves that entities aren't always quote-unquote senseless or quote-unquote illogical or quote-unquote nonsensical. They just have a logic that we don't fully understand. At least, not yet. Signed, former Meg Headfield researcher Eden G. Across its caverns, the level hosts a wide variety of ecological systems. Despite the chaotic and disoriented nature of the environment, these ecosystems are known to be coherent, organized, and complex. Descriptions of some of the more well-documented and unique habitats are detailed below. Hyperspace Lane At the entrance to the cavern, you are arrested with awe. Before you, an incalculable host of lights, note, see entity number 35, light guides, sparkle with an incredible brilliance, illuminating the gloom of the cave like bejeweled stars studded across a velvet night sky, weaving and twirling. They frolic freely overhead, their silent dance a mesmerizing mosaic of shifting constellations. Beneath your feet runs a stream, cold and clear. You kneel by the riverbank, cup the icy water between your hands, and lift it to your lips. It is refreshing, free of the sickening almond flavor to which you have become accustomed. Its cool flow radiates through your insides, rejuvenating your worn body. You quench your thirst, tilting your head back to gulp indulgently and flop down on the ground for a rest. You sit for a moment, soaking in the blissful silence and ponder your journey thus far. Perhaps the caves are not as malicious as you first thought. As you ruminate in quiet wonder, one of the lights descends through the air to break your solitude. Its brilliance radiates gently off the dark, rippling waves, bathing you in its transcendent blue-green glow. The creature pauses in its alluring dance, floating at eye level, barely an arm's length away. Captivated, you reach out towards it. The light guide waits, patient, curious. You hold your breath, your outstretched hand edges forward, slowly, delicately, eager not to frighten the creature. Your fingers hover less than an inch away, a hair's breadth from the otherworldly orb. Then it takes off, whizzing through the air in an elaborate, rhythmic display, beckoning you forward through the opening to another cavern. There it settles, eager, expectant. It urges you onward. Do you follow? Halil or Amna? If Halil, continue. If Amna, view the sublevel of level eight, the Sanctum Subterranus. Hyperspace Lane, this network of 23 long, narrow passageways contains glowing bacteria and fungi that feed off of almond water deposits seeping through cracks in its walls. It also contains a population of native light guides, which are known to help wanderers navigate through its winding corridors. Later passages also contain flowing rivers of regular, non-almond water, which house several species of eyeless fish, shrimp, and newts, feeding off organic debris which flows in from other cavern systems. Xenon marbles may be found at the bottom of these streams, which serve as nesting grounds for the light guides in the region. Rot Nest Jungle The Rot Nest Jungle is a singular massive cavern. It is known for its unique habitat, which has formed due to the dual directional gravity within its bounds. The ceiling of the cave has a weak gravitational pull of its own, and acts as a nesting ground for native death rats. Jutting out from its surface are hundreds of ventilation pipes, 
apparently connected to those of level 2. The rats may be seen scurrying in and out of these structures, perhaps using them as connecting bridges to other levels. To maintain the cleanliness of their dwelling, death rats have been observed to quote-unquote handstand as they discharge their excretions. Their droppings, falling out of the range of the ceiling's gravity, plummet instead towards the cavern floor. Repulsive as this may seem, the accumulation of nutrient-rich detritus has allowed an entirely separate habitat to flourish on the ground of the cave. Sprouting from the fertile soil are a variety of multicolored bioluminescent mushrooms, many of which may grow to the size of small trees. The light allows even plants to grow, in the form of mosses and small ferns, which propagate along the floor. A variety of arthropods thrive in the underground also, feasting on the native flora and fungi. Meg Survival Guide Tip number 4. Respect the locals Image caption Hmm, they seem a little upset. The Rottnest Jungle is a sight to behold. The fungal forest is well known across the backrooms for its breathtaking appearance, though its quote-unquote rainfall is somewhat unsanitary. Note, however, that the cave is a holy site for the Amor Incrementium. A temple sits on a raised hill in the cavern's center, visible from all around. While the residents allow visitors to pass through, they don't seem to take kindly to anyone harming the native fungi or plant life, as tempting as a bowl of mushroom stew might be. Be respectful of local practices, and don't harm the mushroom trees or enter the temple grounds without their permission. New Mobile Cave This cave, roughly the size of a football field, was discovered by a Romanian, who named it after a similar location in his home country. Note, see the YouTube video Weird Places Mobile Cave by SciShow. Owing to its depth and isolation from other networks, the chamber is home to a unique chemosynthetic ecosystem. The waters of the cave are full of bacteria, which break down sulfur and methane gas to produce energy. This, in turn, releases nutrients for fungi and other bacteria, which clump together to form quote-unquote microbial mats on the walls of the cavern and the surfaces of its lakes. The mats, in turn, act as food for insects, which are preyed upon by species such as spiders, death moths, and curabiter birds. Meg Survival Guide Tip number 5 Gas 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 Image Caption Mama Moth doesn't look too pleased. Time for Kenneth to take flight. Thrill seekers love to visit New Mobile Cavern. Apart from the challenging hike there, the cave's unique habitat is also a once-in-a-lifetime sight. It's a hotspot for scientists and researchers from all across the back rooms, eager to catch a glimpse of its wacky wildlife. Travelers should, however, be mindful of the cavern's air quality. The air is hot, humid, and positively reeks of rotten eggs. Be prepared for the stench. More seriously, though visitations for brief periods is possible, high concentrations of gases, such as hydrogen sulfide and methane, make the air toxic over prolonged durations. Visitors are advised to not linger for more than an hour. Additionally, be aware that the cave contains a population of death moths of both sexes. Those who visit are advised to stay on the marked path and out of their way, as females can get very, very territorial. Handyland. No image caption available. When was the last time you saw rain? The pearls of water cascade around you, a fine mist that cakes your surroundings in slick moisture. The crimson glow of moss pierces through, clothing the spikes which erupt from the floor in the shape of human arms. Their silhouettes stand upright and petrified, reaching desperately to the ceiling, each ending in a perfectly sculpted, outstretched hand with five fingers evenly spread apart. The sight is unnerving, trudging forward anyways, and weaving through the clusters of spikes, you catch a glimpse of something moving at the corner of your eye. 
You pause and turn, but nothing is there. Frowning, you squint and peer through the dim fog. The forest of hands is silent. The arms stand tall, erect, and unmoving. As you turn to continue, it happens again, just out of the corner of your vision. Far in the distance, you see something. Something large, and possibly human-shaped, scuttling across the cavern floor. Whatever it was, you are sure that you saw it. And you are sure that it sees you. The hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. Something is following you. Handyland. Spanning several acres, Handyland is by far the largest single cave network in level 8. The system is so immense that it contains its own climate. Temperatures are exceptionally stable, with a narrow range between 64 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees Celsius, and 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 23 degrees Celsius. Wind and rain are frequent, and thunderstorms have been observed on occasion. An electromagnetic storm constantly brews within the clouds at its ceiling, producing a faint, constant aurora that casts a dim twilight glow about the cavern. Most significantly, the stalag spikes of Handyland are responsible for its name. Clusters of spikes in the shape of human arms and hands protrude from all over the cavern's floors. Each spike is highly de detailed, containing even unique fingerprints. Varying wildly in size, some are as tall and thick as oak trees. Almond water, entity droppings, and the faint aurora light allows for the growth of bioluminescent moss, enveloping the stalag spikes in a blood-red glow. These forests of hands contain death moths, skits, and other arthropods which graze on the moss, as well as a subspecies of dunks. The region is infested with predatory entities, such as Ingoiatherzers, Smilers, and Camo Crawlers many of which feast on the grazers about the stalag spikes. As such, the system as a whole is best avoided. The Hive Meg's Survival Guide Tip number six, Prey You try not to breathe, crouched in the dark. You cower in a cleft in the rock. The blind predator, note C Entity 31, camo crawlers, crawling in and out of view above you, sniffing and clicking. It clambers over to a patch of loose rocks on the other end of the chamber, and maniacally burrows through. It finds nothing. The beast screeches with fury, and grabs a boulder with all four of its arms, hurling it viciously against the floor. It smashes into pieces, the impact vibrating through your trembling body. The creature scurries frenetically around the chamber, repeating the process again and again. Its howls of frustration ring in your ears. You are not alone in your hiding place either. You can feel the spiders swarming up your chest, across your arms, down your back, intrigued by your unannounced intrusion into their abode. One crawls up your neck, scuttling across your face and past your ear. You cover your mouth with a hand, suppressing a violent urge to scream. Suddenly, the predator stops directly above you, peering down the crack. You look down and squeeze your eyes firmly shut. Sucking in as much air as you can, you hold your breath as you hear the predator lifting the rock directly above you. Its grunts and snorts draw nearer as its hideous body crawls down into the hole where you are hiding. It leans towards you, sniffing at the air an inch from your nose. You feel its breath on your face. Something strange is happening. A distant rumble travels through the rock under your feet. The creature appears to notice it as well. Abruptly, it withdraws, scuttling back out of the crevice. Your eyes still shut fast. You hear it growling and bristling overhead. Then, with volcanic force, Something explodes into the chamber above you. Over the rumbling, you hear the predator's shriek of terror, and what sounds like the crunch of bone. And all at once, it's over. You remain crouched where you are for almost an hour before you dare to emerge. The chamber is empty. 
A single, mangled arm is strewn on the cavern floor, some distance away. You approach it, warily, with shaky, stumbling steps. The lone appendage lies unmoving on the floor. Spiders have already begun to surround it, nibbling curiously at the fresh meat. You gaze in fascinated horror at the exposed bone. It has been snapped clean in two. In addition to the above ecosystems, some entities are prevalent all throughout the caves. The most common examples have been listed below. Wranglers. More complete documentation on Wranglers may be found in the Meg's article on them. Image caption. Illustration of a male Wrangler. Wranglers are massive serpentine predators, with adults often reaching and even exceeding a mile 1.6 kilometers in length. Though their bodies are elongated and snake-like in appearance, with slimy gray skin, they possess humanoid heads with distinctive white glowing eyes. The faces of male wranglers are uncannily human, with mouths that perpetually sport disturbing broad smiles. Female faces more closely resemble those of arthropods, with pincers sprouting from their jaws. At rest, the entities lie exposed within the caves. However, to hunt, they burrow into the rock layers of level 8, twisting and turning their bodies in a drill-like motion to generate the immense power needed to force their bodies through the ground. While younger specimens burrow physically through the rock, mature adults eventually gain the ability to travel by no-clipping through, only materializing physically when they are close to their prey. The hunting behavior of wranglers also contributes to the instability of the caverns. Large wranglers can damage caves as they burrow to hunt, altering the composition of the network significantly. The specimen responsible for the infamous Level 8 incident created dramatic structural shifts across the level in its entirety, resulting in over 500 confirmed casualties in total. The Wrangler's body was several orders of magnitude larger than average adult specimens, and required several hundred tons of pyroil to burn away. Overall, it was estimated to span a colossal 70 miles 112 kilometers in total length. It is believed that specimens of even larger size may lay dormant further below. Arachnids more complete documentation on arachnids may be found in the Meg's article on them. Within the caves, a disproportionately large number of life forms fall under the arachnida family of arthropods. The arachnids of level 8 include scorpions, ticks, mites, and, principally, innumerably many species of spiders. While some spiders occupy important roles within healthy ecological systems, the vast majority of them form large, single-species clusters. Entire swaths of some networks are dominated entirely by colonies of spiders. These are to be avoided at all costs. Many species found in such colonies are aggressively territorial, and will not hesitate to chase hapless victims who disturb their habitats. Meg Survival Guide Tip number 7. Creepy Crawlies Image caption. Where do these little guys keep coming from? Everyone knows that level 8 has a bit of a spider problem. No matter how much bug spray you carry, you're bound to find them in your hair, in your backpack, and worst of all, in your rations. Extra protein! While well, one, two, or ten spiders aren't normally a problem, some caverns have nests with literal thousands of the critters crawling around. The ninth road generally avoids the areas that are a bit worse off, but new nests are known to pop up along the path from time to time. Do not disturb these colonies. They're about as territorial as your average wasp nest, and many species are highly venomous. If you do happen to stumble into a nest by accident, your best bet is probably to get to the nearest body of water. Spiders can't swim. Well, most of them can't anyway. There is a chance that you may come across nest caverns with strange glowing emblems nearby, resembling hieroglyphs or occult markings. If you encounter such symbols, stop what you're doing, sketch or photograph what you've found, and leave the vicinity as soon as possible. Next, 
head to the nearest campsite and notify any MEG personnel there immediately. Never, under any circumstance, enter caverns with these markings. Recent research has suggested that most spiders are not actually native to level 8. The purported extra-normal abilities, footnote, including, but not limited to, extreme giganticism, hyperpotent venom, accelerated regeneration, biological immortality, invulnerability to fire, and the ability to survive indefinitely without oxygen, and footnote, of many breeds appear to be the products of arcane glyph magic. Note, see phenomenon number 84, for which the Church of the Veiled is almost certainly responsible. Level 8 report, introduced species. Our current surveys have cooperated with the Harmouth guys have been telling us. Data shows that clusters of quote-unquote arachnid infestations are centered around the Old Veiled territory, and their frequency drops off dramatically outside it. This is just more evidence of our mounting suspicions that the arachnids of level 8, by and large, consist of invasive species, more than likely introduced by the Veiled. The clusters don't fit with the other complex ecosystems we see around the caves. They're completely dysfunctional. There just shouldn't be enough food around to sustain such massive populations. I've examined a few specimens from these nests. And I can say with certainty that something just feels fundamentally wrong with these creatures. Even if we flushed out the Veiled, they've been here so long that their impacts left a scar on all the level's ecosystems. They've been experimenting on these spiders for hundreds of years. In all that time, who knows what else they've done in this place. Signed, Meg Entity Research Specialist, Gums. Hands of Tar. Pools of a viscous, tar-like substance, footnote, a substance of similar composition may be found in level 2, abandoned utility halls, level 7, the Lassophobia, and level 41, the Black Lake, end footnote, are scattered across the caves. The temperature of the fluid varies from pool to pool, but may reach heights of up to 203 degrees Fahrenheit, 95 degrees Celsius. They should be avoided. Wandering too close will trigger a group of tar-covered humanoid hands to reach out from the pool, dragging their helpless victim into the boiling, acrid substance to be smothered to death. Owing to their viscous nature, the hands of tar lurking within these pools are poorly studied. The few survivors reported losing consciousness in the pool, and then finding themselves in either Level 41, the Black Lake, or Level 91, Noir, upon white waking. You'd expected your reunion with other living people to be a bit more dramatic. You had thought that the encounter would be more emotional. Perhaps you would have shouted for joy, or embraced your fellow man, or even wept kneeling as you kiss the boots that clad their equally aching feet. Yet here you are, huddled unremarkably around a campfire, amidst this group of sorry survivors. Spoons clink against ceramic bowls as everyone silently enjoys the bliss of steaming hot soup. You slurp the concoction down rather noisily yourself, too grateful to question what exactly the floating chunks of meat within it might be. You plan out what to do with yourself next. A hot shower and a bed for a week. For just as many days of labor in exchange. The work would be trivial compared to the grueling journey you've encountered thus far. It would, furthermore, provide time for advantageous conversation to glean some knowledge of the workings of this accursed catacomb, and perhaps some clue of a way out. You can hardly believe how ordinary it all feels, as if you had always been here, surrounded by these nameless companions all your life. The normality of it all is surreal. As you continue to survey the bed-wrangled crowd, a child runs up to greet you. Though her blonde hair is matted and unkempt, her face smeared with smudges, and her dress ragged and tattered, there is a light in her eyes that you have not known yourself for quite some time. Hey, you're new here. What's your name? You smile, slightly abashed. I'm not sure I remember. It strikes you that these may be your first spoken words in months. I don't mind, the little girl beams, holding out a hand. 
I'm Carla. Nice to meet you. The warmth spreads through your chest, deeper and richer than even the heat radiating from the campfire. You reach for a handshake, but find yourself pausing. Your arm hovers oh awkwardly, half outstretched. No, you decide. That would be too typical, too conventional for such a circumstance as this. Instead, you reach into your right thigh pocket, brushing past your flashlight to something cold, rough, and jagged. You retrieve the stone kazoo and place it into Carla's outstretched palm. Gently, you close her fingers over it and give her fist a firm, affectionate squeeze. The girl pauses for a moment, her bright, curious eyes locked with yours. Then, as abruptly as she came, the child scurries off, clutching her newfound prize to her chest with glee. You watch Carla as she returns to her mother, curling up and snuggling against her chest, her gaze affixed upon the gift in her hands. The light from the crackling flames bounce off her round, dark eyes. Somewhere within, there is a spark of wonder. Landmarks, settlements, and communities. Contrary to expectations, larger caverns are indeed capable of supporting sizable populations, especially those containing rivers or lakes. Apart from vitamins C and D, footnote, vitamin C is supplied by dried fruit and vegetables from BNTG trade caravans. Vitamin D, in contrast, is supplied by artificial UV light or vitamin pills sourced from level 480 inconvenience store. The same BNTG caravans assisting in this endeavor. End footnote. Native life forms, such as fish, can provide sufficient nutrition to sustain human life. Indeed, many permanent communities are known to exist within the level's islands of stability. Along the Ninth Road in particular, several settlement settlements and encampments have been established to provide shelter, food, and other basic necessities. For those too old, sick, injured, or otherwise unable to complete their journey out of the caves, these have become a permanent refuge in which to live out the rest of their days. Friendly Communities Meg Outpost Hollow Nest Established in early 2016, initially known as Outpost Cave Raiders, manned by 20 permanent staff members and approximately 24 posted operatives on rotation. Initially served as a forward operating base for the Meg Argoistic joint campaign against the Church of the Veiled. Today, tasked to shelter and guide wanderers along the Ninth Road, as well as conduct further exploration of the caves. Harmouth Speleological Society Image Caption Sir Reginald Harmouth III circa 1855. Founded and led by Sir Reginald Harmouth III, a speleologist from Victorian England, consists of approximately 100 highly experienced cavers, were instrumental in helping the Meg to map out Level 8 and establish the Ninth Road. Base camp in proximity to Meg Outpost Hollow Nest contains state-of-the-art scientific laboratory. Footnote. Members insist that the base camp existed even before the establishment of the society. Resources within the facility's laboratory and cafeteria regenerate spontaneously, supporting this claim. End footnote. Members are spread between Outpost Hollow Nest, their base camp, and their four other permanent campsites across the level. The Lost. No permanent settlements within Level 8. Hunting parties from both the Legions and the Suns are known to conduct expeditions within the caves, will offer aid to wanderers in dire need. The same parties, however, tend to avoid contact unless necessary, and prefer to be left undisturbed. Cultural and language barriers also pose communication difficulties. A more incrementium. The temple at the center of the Rottnest jungle has been designated a holy site of the Amor religion. Pilgrimages to the temple are common, offer aid and shelter to wanderers, congenial as long as their customs are respected, refrain from harming Rottnest's native plant life. However, not all residents of the caves are friendly. 
Mid-sized caverns along the center sections of the road are known to house squatters who have given up hope of escape and who subsist purely off of vagrancy or thievery. Many of these chambers are not suited for prolonged human habitation due to poor air quality, stagnant water, and a lack of food sources. Without proper governance or management of any kind, these organic clusters easily deteriorate into overpopulated slums, rife with criminal activity, disease, and appalling conditions. Wanderers are strongly advised to seek shelter in established and well-equipped settlements rather than contributing to these destructive enclaves. Advisable to avoid BNTG Resource Extraction Facility 3 One of the first BNTG outposts established, abandoned following the Level 8 incident, conducted mining operations for minerals such as copper, G9, and rare earth metals, now houses a group of antagonistic squatters. Cerberus Research Facility Large cave network recently claimed by the UEC. Purpose, extent, and population size remain unclear. Unfriendly, does not accept visitors. Known to use lethal force at the slightest provocation. You could hear the argument well before you could see it. Please sir, my daughter, this facility is a restricted area. This is your last warning to leave. From the tunnel ahead, the woman's desperate pleas rang harshly in your ears, reverberating off the walls of stone. You round a corner to find a woman you vaguely recognize, kneeling at the polished steel-capped boots of a coalition guard. His face is cast in shadow, veiled beneath his cap. In the dim lantern light, the crimson owl emblem pinned to his chest glints with malice, as does the muzzle of his rifle. Please, sir, we're starving. We're not the Meg. We don't care. Find help somewhere else. Viciously, the guard lifts his leg and kicks forward into the woman's face. Steel and skin contact with a sickening crack. The blood splatters upon the ground. She collapses, her screaming sobs echoing through the tunnels. The guard turns to face the crowd of survivors that has begun to stream in behind you. This is a restricted area. He lifts his rifle, blinding you with the glaring beam of its torch. Leave. The crowd disperses, a handful moving forward to console the weeping figure on the ground. You glance over to the nearby boulder on your left, where a little girl sits, clothed in a bloodied, tattered dress and staring blankly into the void. She is emaciated, her pallid skin white as chalk, her arms and legs bone thin. Moved with pity, you unsling your backpack, reaching for the last of your rations. As you set them down on the rock, you spy a familiar instrument clutched between her fingers, rough and jagged, like uncarved stone. Hey, I think we've met before. What's your name, kid? She turns weakly to face you. Her dark eyes are sunken and hollow, the life within completely extinguished. I... Uh... I don't remember, she whispers. You are trying not to gag at the stench. The forest of tents has thickened, clustered together in a mess of poles, hanging ropes, and sheets saturated with human waste. You do your best not to stumble as you trudge across the slum, the sludge of bodily fluids splashing under your feet with each step. You can feel the tepid mixture seeping into your socks. As you fumble your way through, your foot catches on something behind you. You almost slip, stumbling over something lying half-submerged in the ooze. With your face inches from the filth, you barely manage to grab onto an adjacent tent pole, riding yourself. You turn to examine the obstacle. A body, still alive. The old man is lying in a fetal position, his hands over his face. His arms and legs are littered with open, gangrious sores rotting in the septic slurry. You wince apologetically, reaching down towards him. Sorry about that, sir. Are you alright? Upon contact with his arm, you immediately withdraw. With a mere touch, his skin has sloshed off, thick brown liquid exuding from the open wound. The old man lifts his hands and swivels his head towards you, 
A horrific grin plastered across his festering jaws. There is no skin on his face. Help me, the poor thing whispers. Note, see Entity 15, wretches. He springs forward, lunging for your throat. Meg Survival Guide, tip number eight, wretch infestations. Image caption, a stage three wretch. Avoid these entities at all costs. Wretches are only one more reason to avoid level 8's unsupervised refugee encampments. Owing to the isolation and environmental stress brought on by the caves, the level is a hotspot for infestations of these zombie-like entities. Without proper medical support or infrastructure, infection can spread like wildfires in the slums, reducing them to wretch clusters in a matter of weeks, days, or merely hours. To avoid the wretched cycle, stay out of slums and veiled ruins. Take care to hydrate regularly and avoid overexertion. Remember that the caves also take a toll on your mind. Don't travel alone, but find people you can trust, and be vulnerable with them about your fears and struggles in your journey. Psychological health is key to avoiding the wretched cycle. Additionally, steer clear of symptomatic strangers, especially fully transformed stage 3s. Should symptoms manifest in any member of your party, isolate them and avoid contact with their bodily fluids, and get them to medical care quickly. As a final resort, burn the bodies and possessions of the diseased to prevent further contamination. If scratched, bitten, or otherwise injured by a wretch, Wash all wounds with alcohol or copious amounts of almond water. With such precautions taken, the risk of transmission is generally low. Even if you begin to exhibit symptoms yourself, be aware that the wretched cycle can be cured or at least treated, if care is administered in time. Seek medical support from any Harmouth or Meg encampment as soon as possible. Don't give up hope. Third Grand Archdiocese of the Church of the Veiled Governed from the Third Grand Parish, the Archdiocese was a territory that functioned as a key veiled stronghold and the heart of their empire. Dominated Level 8 for thousands of years, their influence was exerted over the adjacent quote unquote dark levels. Level 5, Terror Hotel, Level 6, Lights Out, Level 7, The Lassophobia, and Level 9, The Suburbs, severely inhibiting travel to and fro were known to enslave, indoctrinate, and otherwise oppress travelers attempting to traverse the level. Human experimentation with arcane glyph magic has been reported, though details are uncertain. Following a successful joint Meg and Eyes of Argos operation, the Third Grand Parish was sacked and completely destroyed. Link to related tale, Beneath the Veil, Meg Records, the Meg Record Keeping Institute. Operation Shattered Eclipse. Begin log 0740. CPT read. Quick match one to stretch. In position. Over. Overseer A. Finally. Copy quick match one. Come in quick match two. Status report over. 2LT Evan. Quick match two. We've been engaged on the south side near the doorway. Mainly threes. Note, see Entity 3, Smilers, 15s, note, see Entity number 15, Wretches, 31s, note, see Entity 31, Camo Crawlers, and those damned spiders. I count about 25 hostiles remaining, quickly thinning out. Report, victory over the Veiled. Date, 12-16-2016. Security status, public. Image caption. The Ruins of the Third Grand Parish Description Following the fall of the Third Grand Archdiocese of the Veiled in Level 8, Operation Shattered Eclipse has been heralded as a complete success. The Church of the Veiled has been all but eradicated from the initial 12 levels of the backrooms. Over months of coordination and planning, the Meg and its allies have rallied together, methodically dismantling Veiled strongholds and disrupting their key supply lines throughout liminal space. The operation culminated in a final assault launched earlier today. 
spearheaded jointly by Meg and Isavar Ghost leadership, the Third Grand Parish was sacked and its inhabitants wiped out completely. The parish had functioned not only as the seat of power for the veiled jurisdiction within level 8, i.e. the Third Grand Archdiocese, but as the ruling authority over most veiled activity across levels 6 to 9. Its destruction has resulted in freedom from veiled control for both level 8 and its immediate neighbors. One of the veiled's three grand priests, Lunier Patrorius V, was also detained during the battle. However, his counterparts, Grand Arcan and Grand Nox, fled the scene, and their whereabouts remain elusive. Lunier refused to, to divulge their location, and was executed shortly following capture. 2LT Evan, be advised, priests have withdrawn into the building and may be headed your way. Over. Overseer A. Copy quick match 2, over and out. CPT read. Get ready boys. Here they come. End log, 0741. The back rooms. You've been here before. Beneath the veil. In every case, laws are made by the ruling party in its own interest. A democracy makes democratic laws, a tyrant tyrannical ones, and so on. In making these laws, they define as just for their subjects only what serves their own interest. And they call anyone who breaks them unjust and punish him accordingly. That is what I mean. In all states alike, justice has the same meaning. Namely, what is for the interest of the one established in power, the one that is the strongest. So it is a sound conclusion that the meaning of justice is the same everywhere. Whatever serves the interest of the one in power, the one that is the strongest. Thurak... Thura... Thura... Thrymachus of Placidon, Plato's The Republic. Click, click. Justin's thumb flicked across the safety of his pistol. His fidgeting was in vain. It did little to relieve the agonizing burn building within his chest as he crouched impatiently against the rough limestone. His knees ached from being pressed into the rocky floor, and the chill of the frigid cave air seeped into the bones of his fingers and toes. The graze across his left palm throbbed. Click, click. Click. Lately, he had been feeling restless and irritable. It was probably from the stress, the mounting casualties, the hours of briefings and negotiations and speeches, the sleepless nights, the unending strategy meetings, where he and his fellow overseers would painstakingly deliberate over their plans again and again and again. But the hard work had paid off. Recruitment had soared the denizens of liminal space rallying around the Meg's defiant battle cry. The Lost and the Eyes of Argos, too, had come to their aid. Together, they had tactically dismantled the veiled parishes across the initial twelve, one by one. If the operation went well, the atrocities would end here, today, at the heart of the last great veiled stronghold in the caves. The Meg would triumph at last. Click. 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 Stop it. It's loaded. Justin glanced towards the blue-clad figure on his left. Unlike him, the marshal was still, stoic, silent. From the moment they'd first arrived, she had knelt unmoving, with the posture of a perfectly disciplined warrior, her back perfectly upright, hands resting gently on her lap. She peered silently over the stony ledge towards the parish in the gloom below. Reverent and serene, she bore the image of a monk, steadfast in prayer. Justin envied her armor, the faint cyan glow of the glyphs emblazoned on her pauldrons, and the deep navy cloak draped majestically over her glinting mail. The overseer posed himself to reply. He turned towards her, straightening his shoulders to display the prominent eagle emblem over his chest. Sorry, what was that? The marshal's helmet swiveled calmly to face him. I said, stop it, boy. Justin's knuckles tightened over his pistols. What did you just call me? There was no reply. 
Haughty eyes peered out from under the marshal's helmet, proud and unrelenting. Within the overseer's chest, the burning sensation flared. May I remind you that for the duration of this operation, I am your commanding officer. Oi. A tall cloaked figure strode up from behind, his head almost grazing the ceiling of the cavern. Justin felt his stomach twist. The Arbiter of Justice himself stooped down beside him, setting his warhammer upon the floor with a dull thud. He turned to his subordinate, his glowing crimson eyes piercing through the darkness beneath his hood. Let him be, Amistraeus. Stay focused. The Marshal glared at Justin in disdain. Yes, my lord. My apologies. The burning sensation within Justin's chest dissipated instantly, replaced with the wave of self-satisfaction. Forgiven, he retorted, nodding curtly. He turned away, hiding the smug smile creeping over his face. As he did so, a green light flashed to his right, where the radio had lain silent for over an hour. Justin snapped to attention and hastily reached down, snatching up the receiver with trembling fingers. Quick match one to stretch. In position. Over. Reed's voice rung out, crisp and clear. The sound was a melody to Justin's ears. Finally. Copy quick match one. Come in quick match two. Status report. Over. Quick match two. We've been engaged on the south side near the doorway, meaning the threes, fifteens, thirty ones, and those damned spiders. I count about twenty five hostiles remaining, quickly thinning out. The thunder of a fire salt grenade emanates from the receiver. Correction, 15 hostiles. Theo's just taken out another chunk of them. Be advised, priests have withdrawn into the building and may be headed out your way. Copy quick match two, over and out. Justin peered out over the ledge. Down in the chamber below, the doors of the Grand Parish had begun to rattle violently as the creatures within strained for release. The cacophony of wild screeches reverberated across the walls of the cave. Looking down, he flicked open the safety of his pistol in earnest, and racked the slide. Click. Kachunk. He closed his eyes, inhaling deeply. The blood rushed to his head, his heart thumping loudly in his ears, like ma maddened drums of war. Boom. The door is beneath flung open, a horde of wretches swarmed forth like rotting intestines spilling out from a gutted carcass. The creatures raced up the walls of the cavern with frightening speed, limbs flailing wildly, putrid ooze flying from every orifice. Thrill surged through Justin's veins. All at once, Meg operatives and Argosic watchers alike sprang out from hiding and opened fire. The approaching abominations melted away in a rain of pyroil and almond water. Taking a final deep breath, Overseer A hoisted himself up on the ledge into full view of the raging conflict and issued his clarion command. Advance! With a fleshy squelch, Justin wrenched the crowbar from the wretch's skull. Reed winced as bits of flesh splattered onto the parish's tiled floor. Gross, dude. Ha! Justin smashed the weapon into the dead creature's face a few more times for good measure. He grinned gleefully as Reed backed away, his face contorting in disgust. The ooze mingled with the blood spilled out beneath their boots, the creature's brains leaking onto the ground through its smashed skull. I can't believe you're this squeamish, especially since you're the one who uses Jimmy. That was once a person, you know. So, we've done it a favor. The thing's been a monster for who knows how long, and now it's dead. He flicked the crowbar gunk flying off the makeshift blade affixed to the hook, and held up the weapon. Since he'd last seen it, Jimmy had received more additions. It was sporting a proper rubber grip now, and at the end of the hook, spikes had been welded on, a far cry from the dull gray instrument they had found all those years ago. I see Jimmy's gotten an upgrade, Justin paused, admiring the craftsmanship. As he handed back the crowbar, Yep, gotta keep him in tip-top shape. Good old Jimmy's been with us from the start. Reed smiled, reminiscing the times that had gone by. He bent down, strapping the crowbar back to his thigh. Fluid still dripped off the blade, trickling down to join the puddle of sludge pooling under their feet. You ever miss the early days, Stretch? He straightened up, 
wiping the grime off his hands and onto the front of his shirt. Justin snored. Why would I? Look what we've accomplished today. He kicked the dead wretch beneath him vindictively. The Veiled were monsters, and the Meg were the ones who fight back the monsters. After today, everyone finally knows what we're capable of. He stepped over the corpse, strolling past the pews and towards the altar. In his wake, several operatives jogged up and flocked around the body, grasping it by the limbs. Dark ooze smeared across the ground as they dragged it towards the door. Around the room, watchers and operatives alike hauled the bodies, slumped all over the splintered pews in the same direction. A hundred more lay outside, piled together and waiting to be burnt. Reed glanced at the scene for a moment, hesitant, before following his friend. Well, what I mean is, you and Andrew have been pretty stressed out recently. Uh, duh, we just fought a war. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You think we should maybe wind down a little, now that that's all over? Justin paused, letting Reed catch up. He stared up at the stained gray glass that loomed above the altar. Faint light streamed through the mural from the fires burning outside, illuminating his face in a monochrome glow. It's not over, though, is it? There's more. For us. He fixed his gaze on the horned goat in the center of the mural. It leered down at him with a sinister, malicious grin. More places to see, more colonies to build, more evil to fight. Reed stood by his side, silent. Wordlessly, the two friends stared up at the profane mural, bathing in pensive thought. Maybe. Maybe it doesn't have to be our fight. Justin frowned. What do you mean? With a glimmer of hope, everyone is looking up to us to lead them. Well, it's not just us. The Eyes of Argos, the Lost, the BNTG, Camp Amber, they can pick up the pieces. And even with the Meg, you don't have to be the one to bear the weight. You know, we could just take a step back, maybe even settle down somewhere. The back rooms don't revolve around... Captain Lestry? The pair glanced back towards the doorway. An operative stood, clutching a radio in his arms staring expectantly at Reed. He rolled his eyes. Be right there. He turned back towards Justin and gave his shoulder an affectionate squeeze. Think about it, Stretch. We don't have to keep doing this. The vanquished stared into the eyes of the victors and smiled. In fact, he would not stop smiling. Broken and bound in shackles on the floor, Grand Priest Lunier Perpetuus V responded with nothing but masochistic glee at every assault, physical or verbal, hurled towards him. The eyes of Argos, at first stoic and unmoved, were themselves beginning to get impatient. For the last time, we command you, in the name of justice, give us the location of Nox and Arcan. With one foot on his head, Marshal Amistris dug the tip of her spear further into his shoulder blade. Blood spewed from the wound, black and horrible, to no avail. The priest neither screamed, nor jerked, nor begged. There was no reaction, not so much as a twitch at the pain. He turned his head towards his captor, a smile still plastered across his face, blackened irises staring up into hers. Justice yields to the strong. And you are cowards. With a scream of frustration, the Inquisitor wrenched her spear from his tainted flesh and threw it aside, kicking the prisoner in the face with her heel. In desperation, she looked towards the Overseer, who stood leaning against the altar, arms folded. Thus far, he had done nothing but watch the proceedings with an odd, macabre fascination. Raising her arm, she pointed a gloved finger at him. You have done everything we know to do. You, you Meg folks, you try. Justin knelt down, staring at the disgusting specimen grinning before him. All manner of strange glyphs were tattooed in black across his wrinkled face. Most he could not identify, but there were some that he recognized. An inverted cross, a crescent moon, a swastika. He recoiled in disgust. Don't you get it? We've already won. Now tell us where the other Grand Priests are, and maybe your death will be quick and painless. You and I both know that is not what I deserve. 
The prisoner beamed up at him, unfazed. Why are you smiling? You lost. You lost everything. Oh, indeed. I do not deny that. Then what is there to smile about, you sick freak? I have lost. You have won. But we have won also. Justin's eyes were transfixed upon the priest's jagged, blackened teeth, set crookedly into his rotting, necrosed gums. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You have defeated us. Then why am I alive? The prisoner leered up at him with glee. Why do you kneel here before me, begging for scraps as a dog from his master's table? Fury blazed in Justin's chest. Clutching his pistol, he raised it overhead and brought the butt of the weapon down onto the prisoner's scalp. There was a crack as the iron surface connected with his skull and a dull thud as his face connected with the granite floor. Though the priest made no response, Justin repeated the motion several more times. He relished in the savagery, raining blow after blow onto the prisoner's bleeding head. Give us what we want, you piece of shit! Yes. Yes! The prisoner began to laugh. It was a horrible, wheezing shriek, nauseating as the screech of sharp bone scraping against metal. The awful sound reverberated, echoing across the ornate walls and pillars of marble. The surrounding watchers shrank back, revulsed. Throwing his weapon aside, the overseer grabbed the priest's smooth, bald head with his palm, forcibly lifting back his head. Languidly, Grand Lundier looked at Justin. His beady pupils pierced past his frightened eyes and into the depths of his soul. Enjoy your inheritance. One conquers, and the conqueror takes the seat of the conquered one. Blood trickled down from the priest's forehead. Like a snake, his, tum his tongue came wriggling from his mouth to lap up the stream, straining his lips with the darkened flow. We're, we're nothing like you. The overseer's hand, still clutching the priest's skull, began to tremble. Blood dripped from the prisoner's chin and onto his knees. How sure of that are you, child? We are in your flesh and bones. Our root is inescapable. Our rot is inevitable. Descendants shall come in eclipse, and together we will blot out the light. Justin let go in horror, the priest's head falling back onto the ground with a sickening thud. Mark my words, we are always in control. Nothing changes under the dark of the lightless sun. He gazed downward. Blood caked the overseer's open, shaking palm. Enough! The Arbiter of Justice stepped forward, Warhammer clutched in his hands. Gladly, Justin got up and stepped back, as the terrible figure towered over the captive. If he won't answer to mortal flesh, he will certainly answer to me. For the first time, the, prison, the prisoner's eyes widened in legitimate terror as Argos raised his mighty weapon. Justin turned away, walking down the steps of the altar. But he could feel, somewhere behind his back, the priest's gaze still fixed upon him. His wicked, lurid grin seared eternally upon his mind. As the warhammer came down, he uttered three final words, branded forever into the overseer's soul. Enjoy your power. Meg, Bettering Humanity. Return to the article on level 8. Though the Veiled have been eliminated, vestiges of their buildings still exist across level 8. Church ruins may harbor cursed artifacts and magic-enhanced entities. Avoid at all costs. The Town of Cavrogust. It is believed that these derelict ruins were home to an unknown species of vaguely humanoid entities who have long since vanished without a trace. Located in a remote chamber which was inaccessible prior to the Level 8 incident, based on the town's modest size, generous estimates put its population at 500. Archaeological evidence suggests mining was the town's primary industry. The community was apparently established as a means of supplying other communities with unique materials hidden deep in the caves. Some members of this group appear to have been adept hunters, 
regularly eliminating hostile entities roaming near the town's boundaries for both safety and sustenance. It is unclear what became of these entities or this town, but there have been no signs of life within its walls since it was discovered. History and Discovery Level 8 has been known for its antiquity. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, the caves have been employed by the Church of the Veiled, the Lost, the Eyes of Argos, and other ancient groups, for benign and nefarious purposes alike. The successful expulsion of the Veiled in 2016 has removed many obstacles previously preventing archaeology, allowing more accurate historical reconstructions of human activity in the caves. Brevity will not permit an adequate examination of the level's extensive past. As unearthed by recent affronts, let it suffice for us to ponder the mystery of its original discovery, and the secrets buried yet further below, concealed by the ever-changing passage of time. The Hypogeal Plain is a clithernal network of caves, its sprawling tunnels interwoven into a suffocating prison. It is bitterly cold, oppressively dark, and fraught with incalculable peril, predators of all kinds lurking at every turn. Given the choice, travelers are warned to avoid it altogether. Yet those who dare to brave its depths, or those whom fate sets upon its path, may find its caves more than meets the eye. Its hollows hold subterranean worlds, restlessly alive with Stygian beauty, their ferocious vigor defying the shadows still. Though the darkness lingers long, faint hope glimmers within the gloom. Excerpt from Ta Diastimikia Viviglia, Tome 7. Footnote. Excerpt and translation provided by the courtesy of the Lost Legion. End footnote. Entrances and Exits. Open Recommended Route, Ninth Road. Image Caption. Diagram Illustrating the Dark Highway. The boiler room of Level 5, Terror Hotel, has a low-risk, high-probability entrance to Level 6. Lights out. A low-risk, low-probability entrance to Level 7, Thalassophobia, and a low-risk, low-probability entrance to Level 9, The Suburbs. Level 6 has a moderate-risk, low-probability entrance to Level 7, and a moderate-risk, high-probability entrance to Level 8. Level 7 has a moderate high risk entrance to level 9 via Tiny's Lair, and a high risk unconfirmed entrance to level 8. Level 8, via the 9th Road, has a moderate risk entrance to level 9, and level 9 has a moderate risk entrance to level 11, the Endless City. View other entrances. Walking through a specific dark hallway in level 103, aircraft carrier will lead to level 8. Wandering through the deep, dark, concrete caves of level 2.1 may eventually lead to level 8. Jumping into the well in level 135, Skazka, can lead to level 8. Small tunnels in level negative 4.1 most often lead to level 8. Some of the multicolored playground tubes in level 283, Funland, open into the rocky tunnels of level 8's caves. The entrance, however, will vanish as soon as one passes through, preventing them from returning from whence they came. View Other Exits Vents in the ceiling of the Rot Nest Jungle are reported to lead to level 2, abandoned utility halls. However, owing to the native death rat population, climbing through is not advised. Entering a tar pit may cause one to be dragged into either Level 41, the Black Lake, or Level 91, Noir, upon waking. This is also not advised. Rare, tight passageways coated in its characteristic silvery substance are known to lead to Level 75, Gallium Caves. No clipping through certain cave walls has been reported to lead to Level 93, the Summit. A door in the cave near Harmouth Camp 4 is noted to lead to level 203, Dead End. Entering is ill-advised, since level 203 has no exit. Purposely no-clipping, note, 
see Phenomenon 5, through the ceiling has been reported to lead to Level 205, Archaeology. Falling through the floor has been reported to lead to Level 69, The Road Trip of Affliction. No image caption available. The crowds that once accompanied you on the road have dispersed. Many have been lost to the cold, the dark, or the monsters that lurk in the shadows. Of the few who have survived these perils, most have turned aside, finding what refuge they can in the worn, scattered outposts of the Meg, its allies, or the slums surrounding the colonies of the Unbound. You are alone now. As you trudge ever onward, you feel the rock turn to sand, and the sand to gravel, and the gravel to asphalt under your leaden, aching feet. A dim glow looms in the distance, a speck in your vision approaching ever so slowly. At last, the nightmare is over. Image caption, isn't it? Level 9, The Suburbs. <laughs>